Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Birds 2, Land's End. Just kidding, we're looking at Bird Box, released on Netflix in December of 2018. I don't know what was in the water this past holiday season, but I have never seen a movie get more requests for a Kill Count than Bird Box. Seriously, y'all wouldn't shut the hell up about it. So just for you, I figured out a way to legally get Netflix movie files in an editable format so I could cover this damn thing. So don't say I never did nothing for you. Bird Box is based on a 2014 novel by Josh Mallerman that takes place in a world where people have to blindfold themselves whenever they're outside, lest they see the horrific supernatural beings floating about that are so magnificently awful they cause the beholder to commit suicide. It's superficially similar to A Quiet Place, denying the characters of a sense to survive, but it is worth noting that the novel Bird Box came out years before A Quiet Place was made. It's also worth noting that this movie is just okay. I can't for the life of me understand why it got so popular so fast, other than, I guess, the memes. As far as the movie itself goes, it's a bit too long and pretty poorly paced, and it doesn't explore all of its intriguing ideas in the most satisfying way. But that's not to say I hated it either. I still found it to be a mostly fun watch, helped by the excellent cast headed by Sandra Bullock. How many kills, self-inflicted or otherwise, took place during this mediocre movie? Let's find out and count them up. The movie begins with my girl Sandy B talking to a couple of kids about an upcoming family vacation that's about to have some real intense rules. Under no circumstance are you allowed to take off your blindfold. If I find that you have, I will hurt you. And don't even think about asking me to pull over for a potty break. The kids, who she calls boy and girl, are instructed to never say a word, and Sandy stresses the point that if they look without a blindfold on, they will die. They grab a couple of birds and stick them in a shoebox, then head outside with their blindfolds on and follow a string to a canoe that Sandy has stored on the riverbank. And then they're off on a fantastically dangerous sight-not-seeing adventure. We cut to five years earlier, where we find Mallory, Sandra Bullock's character, painting in a studio apartment. She and her sister Jessica, played by American horror star Sarah Paulson, watch a news report about how a senseless mass suicide epidemic is spreading from Romania to the rest of Europe and also, like, everywhere else. Not a great world to bring a baby into, which is bad news for the pregnant Mallory. During a visit to check on the baby with a woman named Dr. Lapham, we learn how much Mallory is not looking forward to being a mother. She's even considering adoption, question mark Blue Flower. On her way out of the hospital, she witnesses a woman she had noticed earlier wearing a very burnt orange tracksuit, now smashing her noggin against the glass window. Looks like the suicide epidemic has landed stateside, and although we don't see the final moment of this girl's life, her persistence and the loud crash we hear as Mallory runs away makes me feel pretty secure in putting her on the list. Mallory gets in the car with Jessica and tells her the suicide sickness is here, but that's pretty obvious to anyone not wearing a blindfold, because there be vehicles crashing and police scrambling everywhere as the sisters try to get out of there and get back to someplace safe. Although we see some explosions and plenty of crazy violence, we don't get any definitive deaths amidst the chaos. That is, until the usually cheery Jessica is suddenly overcome with a look of pure dread and falls silent as she drives her car into a kick-ass slow-motion vehicle flip. Oh, and it's a perfect 180 rooftop landing. Nice job, Jess. Mallory pulls herself from the wreckage and watches as her sister casually walks into the street, gives her one last look of sadness, then steps in front of an oncoming garbage truck. Man, now Cuba Gooding Jr. is gonna get away with murder for sure! Mallory is left alone as more explosions and car crashes happen around her, and I'll just go ahead and include this one dude on the count, since he's either dead or a NyQuil driver. And it ain't NyQuil driving time. As Mallory is knocked to the ground by the hordes of people fleeing invisible terror, a woman named Lydia goes to help her, despite her husband Douglas telling her there's no time to be a good Samaritan. Sure enough, right as she reaches Mallory's side, Lydia begins to hear voices. <sighs> Mallory is helped up by another dude, Tom, as Douglas watches through a window, his wife Lydia climb into a burning vehicle and die in the ensuing explosion. Man, I can't believe Lydia did ya that. Tom and another woman, Lucy, help Mallory get to safety inside the home of Greg, a character played by B.D. Wong who's not a little prick like Henry Wu. They join a sizable group of others seeking shelter, including a sweet-looking older woman, a rapper who's got beef with Eminem, and an employee of T.S. motherfucking A. He handles shit. After briefly entertaining the idea that this could be some kind of bio-warfare attack, they realize that all these suicides going on are actually resulting from the victims having seen something. If you look at it, it makes you crazy or it makes you want to hurt yourself? No. It makes you kill yourself. Either way, better break out the blackout curtains right about now. After the TV signal joins the phones in going down, Tom tends to Mallory, who tells him about her sister's suicide, as well as what that Lydia lady was saying before she died. And then she started talking to 
her mom. That woman was my wife. And she wasn't talking to her mother. Her mother's been dead 10 years. Don't get too intrigued by that aspect of these monsters, though, because it's one of many things this movie doesn't bother exploring further. Later on, while Mallory and her bun in the oven are enjoying a prime sleeping spot, safe away from the spooky shadows outside, the movie briefly flashes forward again to her boy and girl rolling, rolling, rolling on the river. But nothing really happens in this flash forward, and honestly, I think it's pointless for this movie to have two timelines like this. It kind of takes away from the storyline in the house, knowing where Mallory and these kids are gonna wind up. When the movie jumps to the past again, we get a purge-like pickup of five bodies to add to the count. Victims who apparently weren't able to make it to Greg's porch, and instead died outside his very cozy looking house. Damn, that place like a comfy cottage on the corner. It's been a few days now, and a radio broadcast is telling survivors what to do and what not to do. As long as you don't look at those things, you should be fine. They hear a knock at the door, and after Mallory takes a defensive position with Douglas's shotgun, Tom agrees to let the woman pleading on the other side of the door inside the house. This woman, Olympia, is also pregnant, which is bad news for the group since they're already low on food supplies. Great, now we can all starve here in the maternity ward. Greg gets an idea to use his house's security cameras to see what's going on outside, reasoning that if they're just watching whatever's out there on a digital screen, it may not be as lethal as looking at it directly. This guy eclipses. They they strap him to a chair to protect him from himself, and after everyone leaves the room, he turns on his security cameras for the boringest binge watch of all time. While he does that, everyone tends to their various needs, whether it be prenatal pills, drops of alcohol, or eyefuls of booty. Not a chance. The world's ending, baby, so... You never know. Before long, Greg sees some leaves blowing and a scary shadow appear on his camera feed, and it becomes obvious that, digital image or not, whatever he's looking at is leaving him pretty messed up. And so, after the others enter his office to find him thrashing around, Greg kills himself by knocking over his chair and breaking his head open against a stone mantle. Damn, dude survived numerous outbreaks of murderous dinosaurs, but couldn't make it through a single marathon of security cam footage. Another night comes, and with it, some character development. Olympia and Mallory become pregnancy pals, Mallory walks in on that Felix dude machine gunning that Lucy chick, and Tom strikes up a flirty friendship with Mallory, because damn, he looks good in the moonlight. Back to the future, Marty, where Mallory is 14 hours into her riverboat adventure with those kids. They hear a dude yelling out that he wants to help them and that they should remove their blindfolds, which is cause enough for Mallory to pull out a gun and wave it around blindly. The riverman accosts her and screams at her to take her blindfold off, sounding all sorts of crazy. I see one. I've seen the truth! Although he assures Mallory that what he's seen is beautiful, she knows that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and right now, she be holding a machete. A couple of swings to the shoulder and neck leave the river man bleeding and screaming after her as she paddles away. And since he sinks below the surface, I think it's safe to put this crazy SOB on the count. In our first kill, that's actually a murder. Back at Greg's boarded up house, the survivors have finally run out of food, and this dude Charlie, played by Get Out's Lil Rel Howery, suggests that they try to restock from the grocery store he works at. To get there, they have to black out all the windows of their vehicle and rely solely on this Jeep's GPS. GPS? You know, like Jeep PS? During their drive, we see two rotting corpses in the street, so I'll go ahead and add them to the count. Oh, and they're a nasty crunch as they drive over them, too. Just a speed bump. Yep, just a speed bump. A fleshy, bone-filled speed bump. At one point, some spooky noises outside and the HUD on the dashboard indicate that their vehicle is completely surrounded, and the shadows that pass overhead indicate that the suicide-inducing creatures are paying them a visit. But they're able to weather the storm and follow the GPS into the parking lot of the grocery store, where they stick a crash landing. You have arrived. They carefully leave the vehicle and make their way inside the store, where Douglas wastes no time heading straight for the essentials. We get some character development when Mallory and Tom talk about how they grew up in towns that weren't too far away from each other. Could have been your, your babysitter. My hot babysitter. You're only saying that because we're all gonna die. Nah, Sandy, he's saying that because you fine, girl. Mallory finds those birds that will eventually be her whitewater rafting companions, and Tom picks up some equally pragmatic walkie-talkies. Wait, what the fuck are birds and walkie-talkies doing at a local-looking grocery store? That shit ain't Costco. Dougie Doug says they should just stay at the store where they have everything they need, but Mallory refuses because she doesn't want the others still at the house to starve to death. Before this debate can get going properly, though, they hear a pounding on the other side of a door that goes to the loading dock, and Charlie 
Charlie recognizes the voice on the other side as a co-worker. This co-worker, nicknamed Fish Fingers, ew, starts to rave and scream about how he wants them to see what's outside. And the birds go nuts as a warning, like their coal mine progenitors did in days of yore. As the altercation escalates, we see another couple of bodies lying dead out in the loading dock, so we'll throw them on the count, even though I can't determine the gender of the one in the back, meaning our pie chart's gonna have a spot of gray in it. Meanwhile, Fish Fingers is trying to fish finger blast his way inside the store, but before he can force the door open entirely, Charlie plays the reluctant hero and charges at him, knocking both of them out into the loading dock, as Lucy and Tom close the door behind them. We hear Double F tell Charlie to look out at the beautiful sights he sees, and then we hear a sharp stabbing sound and see a bunch of blood flow underneath the door. Looks like Charlie has expired past his shelf date, and we know that it's Charlie's blood for sure after we hear Fish Fingers continuing to plead as the others leave the store. That night, Douglas and Mallory share a drink and discuss whether assholes have a longer lifespan than the less douchely inclined. The best way to answer questions like that is with a field test, so Felix and Lucy pull a real doucher move and sneak out from the rest of the group, stealing the car and stranding the others so they can go live in sexual tatted up bliss together. Sometime later, as Mallory tries and fails to reach anyone on their supermarket radio, Olympia makes a judgment call and lets a new stranger into the house. He immediately prays at the altar of Mallory and her shotgun and introduces himself as Gary. Gary says he just barely escaped with his life after a group of psychotic people from a nearby mental institution, not wearing blindfolds, attacked the people he was with. They took us outside and... They forced our eyes open so that we would have to look at the creatures. Although it's an intriguing tale, Douglas is less than sympathetic. New guy, you had a great visit. We really loved meeting you. Now, fuck off. But the non-assholes don't want to condemn Gary to death, so Cheryl smashes a vase over Douglas's head and they drag him out to the garage for some solitary confinement. You live here now, Dougadoo. A tearful Olympia tells Mallory that she only extended Gary the same favor they did to her, and then gets Mallory to promise her that she'll take care of her kid if anything happens to her. I guess it takes a Mallory to raise a village, or something like that. More time passes, and as this mostly happy family jams out to Dion Warwick on the radio, Mallory has some stomach cramps that are quickly upstaged by Olympia's dramatic water breaking. But don't worry, Mallory, there's room for two at this water park. Everyone begins tending to these two ladies in labor, except for Gary, who puts on some classical music and takes out some drawings he's been working on. Say, what you got there, Gare Bear? Some eldritch horrors? Some scary pictures to show in the dark? That's nice. When Mallory gives birth to her little baby boy, Gary gets real excited. Why, he's even got a glint in his eye. That's cause Gary cray cray, as evidenced by him flinging open the blinds like he's trying to evict a vampire. He knocks out Tom with some canned goods and then crazy eyes his way over to Douglas, who he exposes to the outside world by opening up the garage door behind him. Sucks for Douglas, but anyone else think those crazy eyes look crazy beautiful? I mean, damn. Gary walks into the maternity ward right as Olympia gives birth to a wailing little baby girl, and Gary's got one hell of a baby shower gift. Look at this. Gary, no! Mallory ducks and covers, but Olympia's not so lucky. She looks outside and falls victim to what she sees. Thankfully, Mallory is able to wrest the baby girl out of Olympia's arms before she kills herself by running at the window and throwing herself out of it. Oh, and it's not one of those smooth window dives either. That was quite the fumble. Midwife Cheryl tries to keep her eyes closed, but Gary forces them open so she can see the beautiful terrors as well. And after her eyes also get cloudy with a chance of crazy, she too kills herself by stabbing herself in the neck a number of times with a a pair of scissors that she had just used to cut an umbilical cord. Scissors, man. Tools of life and tools of death. Gary tries to get the kids from Mallory so he can expose their eyes outward as well. And this is another concept that I wish the movie explored more. Like, why does he want these babies to see the creatures? Will they become new converts or something? I don't know. In any case, Douglas shows up to save the day with his shotgun and his eyes shut tight. I'm not sure how wise it is to blindly shoot a gun in a room with two new babies in it, but Douglas does manage to hit Gary in the shoulder. During a reload, though, Gary runs into him and knocks him through the upstairs banister, and then finishes Douglas off with that pair of scissors, which he drives directly into Douglas's chest. Wait, did I mention that he stabs him twice? Because he stabs him twice. <laughs> See? Told you. Tom comes too, and he and Gary engage in some tug o gun -o war but the victor and the spoils are determined off-screen. We only hear the shots as we see Mallory upstairs, but since Tom is the one who snuggles up to her underneath the blanket, that means we can put Gary the crazy guy on the count with an off-screen death. With that episode of Insanity over with, it's down to Mallory, Tom, and the babies, so might as well jump ahead five years? Uh, sure, I guess. Not like anything interesting might have happened to these people or society at large in the span of half a decade. The kids 
kids are no longer newborns, obviously, and they're being trained by Mallory to survive in their blind new world. It's a tough parenting gig for sure, but at least Mallory and Tom have each other for sexy smoochin'. One night they hear a voice coming over the radio that tells them there's a safe compound with a community of survivors, and that the best way for them to reach it is by taking the river. The voice warns them, however, that there's a spot of rapids at one point where they'll have to expose themselves and look out without a blindfold to navigate properly. Mallory is skeptical of the radio voice's plan, but Tom's an eternal optimist. He's also the much warmer parent, telling boy and girl tales of his childhood until Mallory cuts them short with a strict sentence of bedtime. See, he wants to give these kids hope and a reason to live into the future, while she just wants to focus on surviving in the present. It's a solid thematic discussion, which reminds me to remind you all that kill counts are just for jokes and review purposes, and aren't a good replacement for actually watching the movie. Bird Box, just like every other movie I cover, has a lot more ideas and character development that I gloss over in the interest of goofs. One day, this makeshift family is in a nearby building enjoying a nice Pop-Tart feast. This is what strawberry tastes like. Well, actually, that's what, uh, corn syrup and riboflavin taste like, but sure. Their mass-produced chow-down sesh is interrupted when they hear a car pull up outside. Also, when that car pulls up, we see a body on the ground that's way too decomposed for me to determine the gender, so another unknown goes on the list. Survival mode kicks in, and they make a plan for Mallory and the kids to get back home while Tom confronts their new visitors. But right away, these folks are bad news, since they tell Tom to take off his blindfold. When Tom hears one of them spot Mallory and the kids, he opens fire, killing two of them right away, a dude and a lady, with some shotgun blasts to the chest. He has to take off his blindfold to find a route behind the others, which lets him shoot and kill two more of the dudes there, again with blasts through the torso. That leaves only one guy left from the group, who is already heading through the trees to get to Mal and the kids. Tom follows him, but when the wind starts blowing up a gal and he hears some voices behind him, he turns around and quickly succumbs to the power of the unspeakable forces. Lucky for Mallory, Tom's will is just as strong as his muscles, and he uses his last bit of sanity to shoot and kill the final attacker, dropping him to the forest floor. Unfortunately, one can only be so strong, and our boy Tom kills himself by putting the gun up to his chin and pulling the trigger off screen. Once again, we only hear the shot as we watch Mallory react to it, but there's no ambiguity here. She and the kids are now on their own. Mallory packs up the essentials, and we're back where the movie started, with her telling the kids that times are about to get rough for them. And with that, we're finally all caught up, 42 hours into their two-day river ride. By now they've reached the rapids and have an under-the-blanket huddle where Mallory says one of the kids will have to look out for her, since she can't risk doing it or else they could all three potentially die. I'll look. No, I will decide, okay? I will decide. Just give me a, just give me a second. I'll do it. But Mallory's steely survival mode breaks down when she thinks back to memories of Olympia and Tom, and instead she decides that nobody's going to look after all. It doesn't take long for nature to best this boat and flip it straight the fuck over, sending the three blindfolded occupants overboard. Mallory looks like the cat from Homeward Bound as she's dragged down the river rapids, but eventually she's able to hear boy yelling for her and pick him up before getting over to the shore, where girl is ringing a bell to let them know where she and the birds are waiting. They head into the woods, where we get a prime example of why you shouldn't do that stupid bird box challenge when Mallory trips on a tree root and tumbles down a hill. The kids, now alone, start to hear voices and whispers that sound like Mallory telling them to take off their blindfolds. Take the blindfold off and look at me. Isn't that dangerous if I look? Yes it is, little girl, don't do it! Mallory hears the kids talking to the wind and yells at them not to listen, then manages to feel her way through the darkness and collect both kids once again. Then she starts hearing voices herself, and they sound like Tom asking her for help. But the unseen beings quickly drop the facade and start chasing her through the forest as they knock down trees like a goddamn smoke monster. Mallory follows a bunch of bird noises straight to the front door of a bird box house. She bangs at the door and begs for them to let her in, and thankfully, karma comes back around and the people inside acquiesce. After a quick eye check with a flashlight, Mallory and the kids are determined to be okay, so they're led inside the community, which is revealed to be a school for the blind. They've got a real nice community in the back, with a canopy overhead to allow safe sunlight in, and a whole bunch of birds to warn them of any nearby dangers. Oh, and lots of good boys, too. Hell yeah, son. Mallory and the kids let their birds join their beaky brethren above, and then see that Mallory's baby doctor is here, too. Dr. Lapham asks the kids what their names are, and although they answer her, Go. Boy. Mallory takes the opportunity to rectify this nominal oversight, deeming girl Olympia after her mother and boy Tom after that hot buff dude who helped save Mallory and raise the two of them. The movie ends with Mallory finally accepting motherhood, and some hope that these kids will have a chance at a normal future. You know, besides the unspeakable terrors that are always awaiting them outside. I may not be able to see, but damn it, I can still count. Here, I'll show you at the numbers. 
Hashtag bird box challenge, yeah! But seriously, don't do this. Ow. Just kidding, I actually have to read this teleprompter. I counted 27 deaths in Bird Box, and the victims consisted of 7 women, 18 men, and 2 victims who I just couldn't tell. That's okay though, learn to live with ambiguity. With a runtime of 124 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 4.59 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Cheryl, who straight stabbed herself in the neck with a pair of scissors a whole bunch of times. Way to make sure the deed was done, lady. Dull machete for lamest kill could go to any of the off-screen deaths or random bodies, but let's give it to Gary, cause I'd rather have seen that bastard die after everything he did. And that's it. Bird Box came out in 2018 on Netflix, which claims that over 45 million accounts watched the movie in its first week out. I guess that's what happens with a movie released during the holidays, when people would rather watch a suicide epidemic than spend actual time with their family. I'll be back next week with another one-off episode, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Allie Hager, Jarvis Fitzpatrick, Nate Singer, and Ebony Griffin. If you guys could do me a huge favor, any movie requests you have, just send to deadmeatmovies at gmail.com. When so many people leave requests as comments on videos, it kind of clogs it up and prevents me from seeing comments on the actual content. Deadmeatmovies at gmail.com. All right, be good people.